Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. That's better. Um, I'm I, I, I realized I was trying to keep Leah Pennyman's Wikipedia page up here, and it keeps going off. I think that's a signal um, <laughs> that, that I should do this from the heart. Yeah. Which is so uh, such a privilege for me to do. And in, in, in the beginning of the introduction, I, I want to add a little bit of this to the story that Michael told us yesterday about the Adirondacks. Um, because there are a couple of pieces that were missing that relate to, uh, very much to what Leah is going to speak about. Um, for example, this is, uh, we're, very, we're very close to the site where um, Solomon Northrup wrote the story that became um, the recent movie, 12 Years a Slave. That this particular um, you know, resort site, of course, African Americans, people of color were not welcome here in its heydays uh, during the times of segregation in this country, but the resort owners went to historically black colleges and universities and hired musicians. So there's a long tradition in all of the Adirondack resorts of having black musicians from those colleges. And um, partially as a result of that, we have one of the best music schools in the country at the north end of the Adirondacks called Crane School of Music at SUNY Potsdam. Another piece of information to remember about the Adirondacks is that while Rockefeller was governor, he unfortunately built a series of state prisons um, around the, the Adirondack Park uh, and started the mass incarceration of black and brown people, especially for victimless crimes uh, related to drugs, for minor infractions of drugs, a legacy that we're still trying to undo. Um, and of course, some of us may remember that in North Elba, which is near Lake Placid, about 90 miles north of here, we have the grave, grave site and former home of abolitionist John Brown. John Brown moved to this area in 1849 to lead African Americans who wanted to farm and homestead. Ten years later, he was murdered by the state in Virginia for leading the pre-Civil War liberation campaign in Harper's Ferry, a very significant, I, I, at first I was going to say a failed campaign, but actually it is uh, credited with starting the Civil War. And the important thing that relates to our next speaker is that John Brown came up here with a project to distribute 120,000 acres of Adirondack land to free black New Yorkers. That was 40 acres apiece to 3,000 grantees. And the reason for the 40 acres was because that was the limit needed for a citizen of the state of New York to be considered eligible to vote. So this is one of the first land reparations projects, and it took place right here, very close to where we are. I think about this because when I introduced Leah, I could certainly talk about their significant accomplishments, um, beginning with farming as a young person um, in the Boston area, and um, the, working with some of the people here in this room over the years, and all the way up to accomplishments that have resulted in a number of very well-deserved awards, including the James Beard Award recently, the Grist 50. There's a really long list of well-deserved awards for the work that I know Leah does from their heart. But what I really want to talk about is and say and, and make very clear to all of us is that Leah is somebody who embodies that connection between farming and activism. Also, Leah is somebody who is a fluent speaker of the language of the land. And all of us here in this room 
understand if I say that the language of the land is a spiritual language and that in order to have the kind of relationship that we are all striving to have with the land, we must learn to speak in that soul way, in that spiritual language. And so I'm very pleased to say as way of introduction that Leah Penniman is somebody who is a fluent speaker of that spiritual connection to our land and especially farmland. I will hope that both my communities who are here together as one will join me in a very warm welcome for Leah Penniman. <laughs> Is there anyone here who loves their ancestors? Could you raise your hands? Yay! Is there anyone here who loves the earth? All right, we are all in the right place. Ashe. Um, I am so grateful that y'all are about to spend the next 40 minutes of your life listening to me because you are never going to get those minutes back. And I just <laughs> pray to honor uh, the gift that you've given me of your time and attention. Um, and I want to start out by just giving some thanks that are customary in our community to give before we get into storytelling. The first thanks is to our ancestors. And I want to call into the room two of my ancestors today. One is my grandma's grandma's grandma. Her name is Susie Boyd. She was kidnapped from the shores of Dahomey, West Africa in the late 1700s to work as an unpaid laborer in the fields of Rock Hill, South Carolina. But before she was snatched up, because she saw the writing on the wall, she gathered up the seeds of okra and cow pea and millet and black rice and melon and braided them into her hair, believing against odds in a future of tilling and reaping on soil and believing that we, the descendants, would exist to inherit that seed. I call in and give thanks to Susie Boyd, and I call in and give thanks to her great-great-grandchild, my great-grandfather, Yerl McCullough, who was a pastor in the black church before and during the Civil Rights Movement, and used the church as a bedrock for organizing, for liberation, and for passing on our cultural ways. So I invite you in this moment to think of an ancestor that had some foresight for you. And at the count of three, we're going to call their name loud and proud into the room, and I'm going to pour some libation for them as well. So conjure up that name. One, two, three. Glory! I also want to give thanks um, and name the fact that this is not my land. And it is a privilege and honor to be here on this territory. And I give thanks to the Mohawk, the Abenaki, the Haudenosaunee, and all other indigenous communities who have stewarded and preserved and protected the sacred land for tens of thousands of years. And it's our custom in West Africa that when you're not in your house, you take off your shoes. So I'm gonna leave my shoes here. and pray to honor the gift that it is to be here on this land that is not my own. I also want to give thanks to these folks. Because if you notice, these shoes I just took off are missing a key thing that most farmer shoes have. Mud. Mud, chicken shit, right? Mulch. The reason my shoes are relatively clean is because somebody else on my team right now has muddy shoes. So I want to give thanks to Demaris and Letitia and Larissa and Cheryl and Noah and Amani and Naima and all of the wonderful, beautiful people who hold down Soul Fire Farm day in and day out so that we can take turns getting off the farm and getting to think about things and feel about things and do something other than, you know, throw straw bales around. So give thanks to the team. <laughs> to my younger child self and my younger child sister who was with my younger child self back in the early 1980s. We were the only brown kids in town 
And if anyone knows about the rural white Northeast and being the only brown kids in town, you can imagine what school was like for us. It was rough. And nature was solace. Grandma Pine Tree held us tight. The fungal hyphae held up our feet, and our ancestors whispered promises of tomorrow to us. At the time, you know, we weren't taught anything about West African traditional religion. We thought we invented the idea that nature was alive and deserved worship. You know, we would go into the woods and make shrines and put down fruit and offerings and make up songs. It wasn't until I had the blessing much later to travel to the motherland, to the continent, that I learned that we were not inventing, we were remembering. So now we're going to get to some stories. In Haiti, when it's time for a story, the storyteller says, creak, and everyone who wants to hear the story responds, crack, creak, crack, creak, crack. All right. So we're going to start at the end. We're going to start at where we are at Soul Fire Farm right now so you know why I'm even talking to you about black spirituality. Uh, but a little bit about our farm. We are on 80 acres of Mohican lands, about an hour and 15 minutes south of here. There are eight of us who collectively care for this land, and we use almost exclusively Afro-Indigenous practices to heal the soil, to call the carbon back into the soil, to call the pollinators back to the land. And we bring forth vegetables, fruits, eggs, meat, mushrooms, and other products, all of which are distributed at no or low cost to the people in our community who are living under food apartheid. A food apartheid is that system that because of your color of your skin and your zip code, you might find yourself with no fresh food, with no access to farmer's markets, right? with a disproportionate burden of diabetes and kidney failure in your community. So we're packing up that food, we're putting it in this super creepy white van, <laughs> which is only slightly less creepy because of the cute teenager and the sticker. <laughs> and those vegetables and other foods are getting to refugees, people impacted by incarceration, people impacted by state violence. We also are a training farm. So we have a few thousand people who roll through the land and our living room every year to learn these Afro-Indigenous methods and how to make a life on land. It has been a deep, deep honor to work with people who then go all across the nation to start urban and rural farms dedicated to the idea that to free ourselves, we must feed ourselves. We also offer a certificate program in looking super fly while hanging onions. <laughs> Talk to me later if you want to learn how to look like that. <laughs> and finally, because, you know, the whole system is pretty messed up, we can't just stop with what we do on our individual farm. We work very hard organizing to change the way that land and power are distributed in the food system. We work with the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust on return of land. We work on policy to try to support farm employees in having fair and equal rights, right? Policy to change the fact that right now the government spends almost all its agricultural money to trash the planet and trash our health and very, very little money on anything life-affirming. And this ex extends beyond the borders of the so-called United States to IET, which is our motherland, right? To Ghana, to Vieques, because the peasant farmers of the world are the ones who are fluent in the language of the land. Mama Claudia, thank you for that. And when we work together and we support each other, this is a peanut seed saving co-op that we help get started in Haiti. When we work together on our irrigation, on our reforestation, that exchange of knowledge is what creates the powerful web of transformation. So that's who I am. But the way that I got there to work at Soul Fire has everything to do with a spiritual journey. My beloved womb sister Naima painted this work of art to honor Susie Boyd, our ancestral grandmother, and to honor the seeds that were braided in her hair. But has anyone ever sat and gotten their hair braided before? What's it like? <laughs> That hurts so good. <laughs> and how long does it take? 
hours, you said eight hours, four hours, it depends on your style, of course, and how small the braids are, whether they're box braids or cornrows. But the point being, it takes a long time. And while you are sitting between your auntie's knees or your grandmother's knees getting your braids, story, song, cultural transmission. And so I imagine that as Susie Boyd was braiding the hair of her children, she was saying, you know, I don't know what's coming, child, ahead. But I know who I am. And I want you to remember who you are who you are in relationship to this planet and who you are in relationship to your community. We're not colonizers, we're not extractors, right? We are the ones who brought forth compost from the earth for the first time back in 59 BCE during Cleopatra's reign, right? Studying earthworms, feeding earthworms across the entire empire. We are the ones who know how to make African dark earth out of ash and bone char and debris from our crops that is so black and so deep that you can literally take a soil core and count the rings of it to determine the age of our communities. We are the people who figured out how to transplant rice into patties that had been fertilized by our cattle and have a rotation that lasts for generations without depleting that very soil we depend upon. We are the ones who came up with the work party you come over and plant beans with me, and then I'll go over and plant your beans a couple weeks later. Our harvest will be staggered. The host provides the food and the brass band. <laughs> we are the ones who came up with a proto-credit union where we pool our money and resources together and take turns fixing up the thatch on our market roof or getting the new mule that we need. Don't forget who you are, child. And so I traveled back to find the origin of those seeds. This is the year 2001. I'm a snot nose, just graduated early out of college, gonna find myself in West Africa kind of person. Maybe help, that's the wrong four letter word. Um, let's just say I got an education. Part of the education was when I had a dream that I was planting maize on this mountain that I saw on the horizon. But the dream wasn't in English, it was in, a, it was in Krobo, which I didn't speak very well, but I remembered some of the lines because I was trying to learn this language. And so I went to my friend Michael, who's the son of the chief and sort of my adopted brother over in, in Kroboland, Ghana, West Africa. And I said, I had this dream and it had this line, this is what it was. He said, oh, that's the old Krobo. That's the old Krobo, we don't even speak that anymore. We're going to the priest. So it began. So I go to the priest, tell him the dream, and he said, well, that mountain, you know, is where we fortified ourselves against the slave catchers. We all moved to that mountain, we stayed there, we fought as long as we could, but almost everybody got snatched up. That's why there's only 3,000 of us left. Um, but nobody is allowed to plant maize on that mountain unless that is their ancestral home. So clearly you must be from here. This is before DNA testing. You know, fast forward, we are from there. That was kind of cool. Um, <laughs> Didn't know that at the time. But he's like, well, since you're from here, you know, you're old and you haven't gone through initiation, you haven't gone through any of the rites of passage, we gotta get you, you know, come correct and do all this. So here's me with the teenage girls um, going through depot to officially become a member of the community. Learning about, you know, the rituals of the value of silence and mindfulness. We have a leaf in our mouths to teach us to listen before we speak, right? Learning about um, the wealth is counted in the number of beads, and the beads are handed down from your grandmother's lineage. They weigh around your waist. The weight of the beads is the weight of your stories, of your ancestors. Deep. And my mentors there, the Queen Mothers, who are some of the most badass people you would ever meet. So the Queen Mothers, there's uh, 400 of them in the whole region. And they are selected because of their high moral character and high work ethic because of their ability to listen. And they're in charge of a lot of things. So the queen mothers, they do all the conflict mediation, they select the chiefs, they run the rites of passage from birth to death. Um, they're in charge of keeping the stories alive for the community, spiritual bath and healing, and farming. They also take in orphans and run businesses with the orphans in order to uh, help raise them. So they have a boutique business, they have farming businesses. So I spent most of my time with the Queen Mothers. 
and they eventually had me become a queen mother, so that's why my other name is Manye Amidede, and they told me, you know, you need, the United States is messed up, y'all. Like, United States, and y'all heard me tell this story, but they're, they're basically asking me, is it true that over there, you know, the farmers, they put a seed in the ground, and, and they don't pray, or sing, or dance, or pour libation, or, or even say thank you to the earth? And then they tell the seed it should grow? I was ashamed, said yes. They said, that's why you're all sick. You're all sick because you treat the earth like a commodity and not like a relative. So we're going to teach you, and when you go back to the United States, you're going to do real sustainable development, culturally informed sustainable development. This is the most important proverb. Blefono ke ina ni lu se yomoyo ni goto di kepa le. The white man says he is rich, but the old lady with her black beads surpasses him. What is wealth? They really got me thinking, what is wealth? I think wealth is the seed that is transmitted through the braids of our ancestors that we remember. And a lot of folks think, you know, there's this false narrative that as African American people, we're so disconnected from our past that we don't even have a culture, we don't have language, all of our ties are broken, we don't know where we came from. But I'm gonna put forth a different story. Because I believe that in every generation, there's been enough rememberers that we have all the puzzle pieces we need to reclaim our sovereignty. Woo! Yes, yes. Here's one of the rememberers right here. Anyone know this man? George Dr. George Washington Carver, right? If anyone's ever been to an elementary school during Black History Month, you've definitely seen his face on the wall with like a peanut next to it. <laughs> because supposedly he made 3,000 peanut inventions. But Dr. Carver was so enthralled with the peanut because of the family that it belongs to, which is what? Legumes. Legumes. Legumes are the magical best friends of the whole biosphere. I mean, they literally can call over to a bacteria, rhizobial bacteria, and say, I want to be your homie, like I want to be your friend. I made a house for you in my roots, and I filled it with sugar and just the right mix of gases. And if you move in, there's only one small thing I ask of you. Can you inhale the nitrogen from the air and transform it into an organic form and share just a little bit with me? And that's why the soils have nitrogen, right? Because of that friendship. So Dr. Carver noticed that the cotton fields monocropped in the south were destroying the soil, yields going down year after year, rampant erosion, and convinced a whole generation of farmers in the late 1800s to take their land out of cash crops and put it into a rotation with legumes. He convinced a generation of farmers to spend their winters going to the swamps and mucking out the ponds of the organic matter, piling it into compost piles and mulch. He had to quote Bible verses to get people convinced, because I mean, who's gonna stop planting their cash crop? You know, he said, God says, whatever you do unto the least of these, you do unto me, and God is talking about the soil life. And because he couldn't get the word out fast enough, just preaching from Tuskegee University, he started the first ever extension agency in the country. First with just a mule and a cart. And their method was fabulous. It was kind of like extreme farm makeover. They would go <laughs> county by county, and find the most dilapidated, whack, messed up farm with sick animals and dying fruit trees, and they would just redo it. They would, you know, get the fertility back in the soil, fix up the fencing, you know, help the animals get rid of their parasites, they would prune the trees, and that would become the demonstration site for the county. So everybody would come and learn, and then they'd go to the next county. This is a generation and a half before Rodale. This is the father of regenerative agriculture. 